Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is on the law of the Lord, and on his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Welcome to the Bread of the Word podcast, a podcast striving to feast on God's Word and let the Bible speak to us all. Let us, as a former generation said, go ad fontes to the fountain and be nourished and sustained by all that God is. Let's dig in together. Hello and welcome back to the Bread of the Word podcast where we go ad fontes to the fountain, to the Word of God, to be nourished and sustained by all that God is as he's re- revealed himself to us. My name is Tyler and we are continuing through the book of Job. Coming to chapter 13, and I am very excited for this one. There's a lot that God has shown me in these very few verses, as it ties into other scriptures that I'm very excited to share. This ties beautifully into the promise of Christ to send the Holy Spirit. And so I'm I'm excited to dig into this. Without further ado, let us jump off with verse 17 of Job 13. It says, Hear diligently my speech and my declaration with your ears. Behold now, I have ordered my cause. I know that I shall be justified. Who is he that will plead with me? For now, if I hold my tongue, I shall give up the ghost. Only do not two things unto me. Then will I not hide myself from thee. Withdraw thine hand far from me. And let not thy dread make me afraid. Thou call, Then call thou, and I will answer. Or let me speak, and answer thou me. How many are mine iniquities and sins? Make me to know my transgression and my sin. Wherefore hidest thou thy face, and hidest me for thine enemy? Wilt thou break a leaf driven to and fro, and wilt thou pursue the dry such stubble? For thou writest bitter things against me, and makest me to possess the iniquities of my youth. Thou puttest my feet also in the stocks, and lookest narrowly unto all my paths. Thou settest a print upon the heels of my feet, and he as a rotten thing consumeth, as a garment that is moth-eaten. <clears throat> so to back up a couple verses, we we started with Job's response to Zophar, Bildad, and Eliphaz concerning the wisdom they have attempted to offer, much of which is is true about God, but is askew in its application. And we closed um, last week with verses 15 and 16. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him, but I will maintain mine own ways before him. He also shall be my salvation for a hypocrite shall not come before him. And I believe that we shift audiences after that verse. I think we come to a a point here where he is not speaking so much to the friends as he is speaking to God. And I think that's important given the, the content of what we just read. That I think this is best understood as now Job is speaking to God, not Bildad, Eliphaz, and Zophar. <clears throat> and he says unto God, Hear diligently my speech and my declaration with your ears. Behold now, I have ordered my cause. I know that I shall be justified. And so we have this continued communion with God on the part of Job. <clears throat> he said that, and told the friends, Though he slain me, I will trust him. I will maintain my ways before him. And so here, I have ordered my cause. He's just reiterating what he told the friends, but now to God. I have ordered my cause. I know where I stand. 
<clears throat> and I know that I shall be justified. Where he is resolved in that. But then we have the question. Who is he that will plead with me? For now, if I hold my tongue, I shall give up the ghost. Which is to say, I shall die. I shall yield my spirit. <clears throat> and that phrase, if you are familiar with the King James Bible at all, that is a phrase that pops up in the account of Christ's death. Because Jesus dies on the cross in John 19. <laughs> Verse 30, he says, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished, and bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Same line, <clears throat> same, same, same statement, give up the ghost. And that's basically the way that King James talks about yielding the spirit. It's, it's almost a poetic way of saying, die. And so with Job, if I hold my tongue, if I keep silent, it will be as if I die. So he, is, he needs continual communion with God, he says. I need to keep in fellowship with God. Else I shall die. But the question remains, who is he that will plead with me. <clears throat> he says, I know I will be justified, I'll be vindicated despite my sufferings, but who is it that will plead with me in the meantime? Isaiah 58, Isaiah 50, verse 8. is very interesting. It, it comes after Job. This is not something that was written at the same time as what Job just said, but Isaiah 50 verse 8 says he is near that justifies me who will contend with me let us stand together who is mine adversary let him come near to me and so we have this question in the Old Testament of who will stand with me who will plead with me because the one who justifies is near this is echoed by the Apostle Paul in Acts 17 that the, the God who made the world does not dwell in temples made by man. Nor is he served as if he needeth anything. For he giveth unto us life, breath, and all things. He goes on to say that he is not far from any one of us. <clears throat> and so God is, there, there's a nearness to God. But we're also seeing the expression of a sense of distance. A feeling that God is somehow isolated from us, or rather that we are isolated from him. We see this in Job. We see this <clears throat> all over the Old Testament. Um, one of the saddest statements in the Psalms is the last verse of Psalm 88. I am alone. My companions have become darkness. You have caused my beloved to shun me. That stings. <clears throat> that is not a. That's not a fun statement. That's not easy to easy to say. That's not easy to wrap our heads around. But there is. There are times, as the Old Testament would testify, there are times where the believer may feel distant from God. Song of Solomon, a good chunk of the book. The the bride and the bridegroom are not together. And the bride is lamenting the fact that her beloved is somewhere else, that they are not together. And likewise, Job seems to lament this feeling of distance between him and God, between him and, as he keeps calling him, El Shaddai, the Almighty, the, the Overpowerer. God is the supreme being. He is the, the highest of the higher powers. <clears throat> there is nothing higher than him. But yet, for all of his communion, and all of his prayer, and all of his resolve to continually praise God, and pray to him even when he isn't particularly fond of what he's doing, Job feels estranged. <clears throat> and so while we've had, in some of his previous laments, we have had mediator language talking about there is no one to stand be between us, here we have this idea that there is a lacking of comfort, that there is no comforter, there is no advocate. 
there is not, not one to plead with me. So where do we find these things? I would say that this is, that in part, this is a promise of something that the believer has in Christ. That the, <clears throat> the comfort and that pleading that Job longs for is a promise of God manifested in the Holy Spirit. Turn with me to John chapter 14. We're going to hang out there for a little while. John 14 is part of a section of scripture that the big wigs like to call the upper room discourse, which simply means that Jesus went into the upper room and talked with his disciples. And this is sort of his, his last remarks before he is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is the last things he wants to make clear, the things he wants to bring to their remembrance before he is arrested and eventually crucified. And much of it is dedicated to things like, as I have loved you, you should love each other. That, that, that's a big one. But one of the many things that he promises <clears throat> is comfort. So, John 14, picking up in verse 15, If ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. For he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall also live. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. <clears throat> so, right off the bat, I see parallels with Job, because Job has stayed the course as far as he's concerned, he has endeavored to keep commands, to obey God faithfully and truly, to, to fear God and eschew with evil, as we see in chapter 1. And we're told here to the disciples, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you keep my commandments, it is he that loves me. And he that does these things shall be loved by my Father. And I will love him, and we will manif and will manifest myself to him. Verse twenty two. And Judas saith unto him, that is not Judas Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not into the world? <clears throat> that's, that's a good question. How will the the disciples, how will believers have Jesus without the world having Jesus? And Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. Just repeating what he just said. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him, our home with him. He that loveth me, he that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things I spoke have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you? But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Ye have heard now, I said unto you, I go away, and come again unto you. If ye loved me, ye would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you, before it came to pass, that when it is come to pass, ye might believe. 
Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh, and hath nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. <clears throat> Big chunk. So what's what's going on here is he grounds it in he grounds the commandments that they are to obey in the love of Christ, which reciprocate, reciprocates into being loved of the Father. That is that that's crucial. That's context here. That we love because he first loved us. And we keep the commandments out of love. And that love is a keeping love. That we are loved by the Father because Christ loves us. And so we have been given Christ, not the world, but those who believe have him. <clears throat> And he that does not love him does not keep those commandments. That's a, that, that is a stark contrast. And we can draw parallels with Job, that Job has endeavored to keep the commands, to, to love God, to serve God, and Job is loved by God. So much so that God refers to him <clears throat> with much endearment and says, Hast thou considered my servant Job? No one on earth is like unto him, who feareth God, and escheweth evil. And two times in this text, Jesus promises someone he calls the comforter. Other translations may say the advocate, or something to that effect. But the Greek word is Paracleton, which means the one who comes alongside. And I think, personally, I'm fond of the term comforter as opposed to the advocate. <clears throat> I like comforter. And the picture is one who comes alongside him, Idas, who comes alongside us, who brings a comfort that is different than what they've known thus far. Because though the Apostle John, as it says in the King James, lay upon Christ's breast, as they, they, they experience a very intimate brotherly love, though they had that, it is better for them to receive another comforter it's better that Jesus goes away, that this comforter may come. That is crucial. <clears throat> and so it is better for the Holy Spirit to come, and Jesus to ascend back to the Father. And it says that the Holy Spirit, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Meaning he's not bringing them new information necessarily. He is bringing to remembrance what Christ has already said and bringing to remembrance who Christ is. There, there's, there's, not a, there's not a divide here. Because it's all God. <clears throat> but the Holy Spirit is that next step in what God is calling them into as his apostles. And what does that, this have to do with Job? Because this is who will plead with us. When Job cries, who is there that will plead with me? This is who will plead with me. The Comforter who proceeds from the Father in the name of the Son. Who will bring to remembrance all things that Christ has taught us. Who will give us peace and rest and guidance. <clears throat> What's more, if we go to Romans chapter 8, Paul fleshes this out a little bit further. If we go to verse 20, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, 
but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. <clears throat> that is that the whole world has groaned. It yearns to be remade. That the sufferings of our day, in this present time it says, are not worth comparing with the glory which shall be revealed. And that is something that all of creation yearns to see. So much so that Paul compares it to groanings, to, to physical pain. <clears throat> For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not, not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, that is Christ, the person and work of Christ, who accomplished everything. It is finished. The first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, what doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for what we see not, then we do with patience wait for it. And likewise, the Spirit also helpeth, our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. <clears throat> and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? <clears throat> Again, big text, big ideas. <clears throat> but the Spirit helpeth us, helpeth our in infirmities. What does that mean? It means that when we don't know what to pray for, the Spirit prays with us. The Spirit in makes intercession on our behalf. So when we don't have the words to say, when we are not eloquent enough to articulate to God what our burdens are, God already knows. Because of the mutual pleading of the Holy Spirit. Which brings us right back to Job 13. Who will, who is there that will plead with us? Who is there that will plead with me? For now, if I hold my tongue, I shall give up the ghost. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit shall plead with us. That if we do not have the words to say, the Holy Spirit prays and makes intercession on our behalf. And God hears that. So moving on to verse 20 now. We've covered three verses. <clears throat> Only do not two things unto me. Then will I not hide myself from thee. He asks God for two things. Two things. Withdraw thine hand far from me, and let not thy dread make me afraid. Then call thou, and I will answer. Or let me speak, and answer thou me. So the first thing is... Withdraw thine hand from me. Because again, we are ascribing what Job has experienced ultimately to God. That ultimately what he has endured, what he has suffered, is from the hand of God. <clears throat> and that's not, that's not simplistic. That is, in the grand scheme of things, God is sovereign. And so Job asks him to withdraw his hand. 
he plies unto the sovereign God as a remedy. And step two, <clears throat> item number two, is how many are mine iniquities and sins? Make me to know my transgression and my sin. Ouch. <clears throat> so the these two things lead us straight into what he just what we just read in verse nineteen. Who is it that will plead with me? For it is by the Spirit that we ask these things of God. These are not things that we would we want to acknowledge. <clears throat> the the carnal person, the natural state of our our personality is not to acknowledge that God is sovereign in our sufferings and is not to acknowledge that we are sinners, that we have sins that God sees. <clears throat> and these are things the Holy Spirit makes us aware of. That Yes, God is sovereign when things hurt. And so when when Job suffers, he can talk to God about it. So can we. But he also asks God to make known to him his sins. In a way that is echoed by Psalm 139. Which is a psalm I've pulled out, out of my hat a couple times in Job. It's it's so relevant to what we see in Job. But Psalm 139, verse 1. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. <clears throat> Ultimately, God knows Job better than Job knows Job. And so he goes to the one who knows the whole story and says, Make me to know my transgression. As we saw earlier in, in Job, in chapter 12, With the ancient is wisdom, and in length of days understanding. With him is wisdom and strength. He hath counsel and and understanding and God is beyond ancient he has always been and always will be so there is no one wiser and more knowledgeable than him <clears throat> and so by the spirit who pleads with us we are also made to know our iniquities we are made to know the hard things about us and about what God is doing. Our eyes are taken off of the temporary and onto what truly matters, what is truly most important. <clears throat> Verse 24. Wherefore hidest thou my, thy face and holdest me for thine enemy? Wilt thou break a leaf driven to and fro? Wilt thou pursue the dry stubble? Will God hide himself and break delicate Job? That, that is a question that he asks. And that is that's a valid question. It's something that Job will wrestle with, honestly, for the entirety of this book. Is the faithfulness of God while simultaneously being under his hand, as he, as he described earlier, withdraw thine hand. <clears throat> and yet God has... Somehow, Job has to reconcile this with the fact that God is faithful to uphold his people. And maybe that doesn't feel comfortable in the moment. Maybe it does feel like he is breaking a, a leaf driven to and fro in the wind. For thou writest bitter things against me, and makest me to possess the iniquities of my youth. Thou puttest my feet also in the stocks, and look as narrowly unto all my paths. Thou settest a print upon the heels of my feet, 
and he as a rotten thing consumeth as a garment that is moth-eaten. This is how Job feels concerning his suffering that he is endured by the hand of God. <clears throat> and God is not afraid of Job's questions. He's not afraid of what Job will think of it. Because Job continues to commune with God in the midst of that. And we, through the Holy Spirit, have that same ability, that same opportunity to commune with God in the good and the bad, in the, in the easy and in the painful. Because the Spirit help us, helps us in our infirmities. So when we don't know what to pray, when we are suffering, when we are sick, when we do not understand what God is doing, God hears that. <clears throat> because it's not just words when we pray. But when we pour out our heart to God, he hears it because of the intercession of the Spirit. That it's not, we're not left to our own devices to persuade God to arise and act. But rather, God is never left. He's pleading with us, and he's hearing us. And this is a reality that Job struggles with throughout the book is that God is doing both that God is both here and he's also in heaven hearing because the one that justifieth me is near and so in closing <clears throat> we're left on a low note at the end of this chapter and we will Continue into chapter 14 with man is born for trouble. So we will continue in the, the lament of Job for a little while yet uh, before we get back to his friends. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, we are not alone. We are not cast off and abandoned or forgotten. God has not forgotten us or abandoned us because we don't pray well enough. Rather, God has continued with us, despite our routine unfaithfulness, despite the fact that we're not eloquent enough, despite the fact that we don't know what to pray for as we ought, God is still here. And we have help, we have comfort, we have rest in God, by God. And that's why the Holy Spirit is called the Comforter, the one who comes alongside us. Because God knows that is something we definitely, desperately need. And so as we continue through life, walking the path that God has us on, there is a Comforter who walks with us. Thank you for listening. This has been the Bread of the Word podcast. Bread of the Word is a podcast ministry striving to feed people the wonderful words of God, book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse, striving to let the Word speak for itself. This ministry is also a member of the Truth and Love Network, a diverse fellowship of fellow podcasts of different theological backgrounds united in the gospel of God. For more from the Bread of the Word podcast or the Truth and Love Network, check out the links below and follow us on social media. Until next time, God bless. Matthew 4.4 4.